So let, let's kind of review the context. I mentioned the wall opened in, in November of 89. As you may recall, events were moving very quickly on the ground. Um, and this created a, a, a momentum that the diplomats and the, the heads of government sort of had, had to address. In February of 90, Baker goes to Moscow and his prime purpose was to try to convince Gorbachev and the Soviets that we needed an external process to match what looked like was happening on the ground, the internal unification. And that's what led to the so-called two plus four. And the logic there was you had the two Germanys in the front, and we wanted to emphasize that because we wanted, we didn't want to block unification. But the four were the four powers coming out of World War II and the Potsdam Accord. So the United States, Soviet Union, Great Britain, and, and France. And the reason you needed some group like that was you still had the four power rights from World War II, including over Berlin. You had 380,000 troops uh, in the East. And so we needed an external mechanism that sort of matched what we hope would be the internal mechanism. While there, Baker was also making the argument that the Soviets should uh, agree to a united Germany in NATO. Now, again, we've sort of assumed over 30 years, this is an acceptable idea. At the time, this was seen as very controversial if you look at the editorial opinion. Um, and Baker posed a hypothetical to Gorbachev. He said, you know, would you prefer to have a united Germany sort of independent, neutral, not linked to the West um, in the heart of Europe, uh, or would you prefer to have a united Germany in NATO uh, with the jurisdiction not one inch further. Now, what he was trying to do was he was trying to force Gorbachev to face a difficult choice. Of course, Gorbachev didn't want a united Germany and NATO given the Cold War history, but how, how, how did he like the idea of, sort of recreating a powerful Germany in the center of Europe that, wouldn't, that might have to worry about its security and its borders and others? And so in a sense, Baker was hearkening back to the experience of the 20th century. Now, it's that hypothetical that Putin goes back on, but then one has to look at what happens during the rest of, of 1990. So that's February. In March, you have the elections in East Germany. It's overwhelmingly support for coal and the idea of unification. Um, in June, uh, Gorbachev comes to Washington. Um, and this is really the key moment where he accepts the idea of a united Germany and NATO. And the, the logic there really undermines Putin's argument because I had discovered that in the CSCE principles, that's the Helsinki final act, there is language that all the parties had agreed to, and Gorbachev actually was a big supporter of the CSC principles, that countries should be free to join their own alliance. So President Bush says to President Gorbachev, Mr. President, we believe Germany should be in NATO. But can we both agree that under CSC principles, Germany should be free to decide? And Gorbachev says, yes, <laughs> to the surprise of everybody. And I remember kind of, on the other side of the table, you can almost feel the Soviets starting to physically distance themselves away from Gorbachev. Bob Blackwell, who was on NSC staff, sends me a note saying, did you hear this? You know, and should we ask the president to repeat it? And yes, so we give a note to President uh, Bush and Bush repeats it and Gorbachev sort of agrees again. Um, now, you know, nothing's ever final until you sort of put the words on, on paper. One further step we took was that a couple of days later, they had a joint press conference, Bush and Gorbachev. And we had the, uh, the Bush opening statement, which we, we repeated the same idea about having Germany under CSE principles decide its alliance. And we show that to the Soviets and there was no objection. So, you know, that's a big hole for Putin because if the basis was Helsinki principles, well, then what happens to other countries that may want to join NATO? But the critical part, of course, as you know from your international experience, is this all had to be worked out in that two plus four agreement. And that's what uh, gets done during the course of 1990. And there is language in the agreement that limits the notion of, of NATO in the former East Germany. It's quite specific. Until the Soviets leave, there's no uh, foreign forces. After 1994, when they leave, 
Germany could have its NATO forces, but there would be no non-German NATO forces in the Eastern states, um, uh, except they wouldn't be able to be stationed or deployed there. So there's nothing in the treaty that precludes Poland or others joining uh, NATO. And indeed, you know, I have to smile if anybody's watched Soviet or Russian diplomacy, the idea that the Russians would say, oh yeah, you posed a hypothetical to us and that's good enough. We don't have to get it in writing. It's a little crazy given you, if you watch how the Russians act. It's interesting to note that Chevronadze, the Soviet foreign minister, Kozarev, the Russian foreign minister, both say there was no promise. But I have one other interesting little anecdote, which is on the last night before the treaty was signed in Moscow in September, we were, we were quarreling over the definition of deployed. I mean, what does deployed mean that you couldn't have non-German NATO forces deployed in need? And I'm thinking to myself, you know, someday Poland may want to come into NATO and the US may need the ability to move forces across the former East Germany. And I don't want that blocked. Now I didn't put the hypothetical out on the table, but I wanted mm -hmm. to make sure that the language permitted it. And there was a big kerfluffle overnight that the historians have written about, which we finally agreed the next morning to say, well, the definition of deployed will be up to United Germany um, and taking into account these issues, which I thought was safe enough since Germany would be a NATO member. So those are all factors that, you know, at the yeah. end of the day, you have to look at the treaty language, you have to look at the basis of, of how Gorbachev came to the decision. Um, but as, as we both said, you know, Putin will use any leverage he can.